delighted to be back uh, again. It was uh, a great discussion last year, and I, I couldn't have picked a better panel for today. Uh, we've got John Laxland, Professor Laxland, a former Australian Army officer, director of the ANU Southeast Asia Institute, head of the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre in the Bell School. Dr. Hung Lee Tu, currently a visiting fellow in the Bell School, educated in Poland, PhD from Taiwan, until recently based at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore. And third, Professor Hugh White, a former senior government official, ministerial advisor, including in uh, this building over many years, who headed the Australian Strate uh, Strategic Policy Institute and then the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre. We're here to talk about Australia's changing place in a changing world. So let's get stuck into it. John Blacksland, first to you. How is Australia travelling? Uh, <clears throat> I'm a glass half full kind of guy. Uh, I'm actually reasonably upbeat about the place of Australia in the world. We are doing remarkably well despite uh, all of the naysayers and the, the, the gloom uh, uh, predictors. We, we seem to be able to uh, weather storms pretty well. Uh, our political system has uh, you know, a, 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 an obsession with, the, uh, I ought to say, a bit of narcissism, uh, very much focused on uh, froth and bubble uh, in terms of uh, uh, where we're heading, uh, and that is a, a arguably a big uh, a, a detractor from our, uh, our political system, and it's you know, bringing questions about the uh, appropriateness of our democratic model. But when we step back and we compare uh, Australia to uh, many other countries, our, our own neighbours, uh, and people in other predicaments, we are actually, you know, and, and uh, Senator Penny Wong had talked about this in, in, in passing about Donald Horne's sarcastic comments about the lucky country, but we still are in that predicament. You know, we are still extraordinarily fortunate. We have things very much going our own way. Um, and that is, I think, partly uh, because of institutional factors. You know, as Winston Churchill says, democracy is the worst form of government apart from all the others. Um, and yes, yes you, you know, we can, we can really be uh, hard on ourselves about the, the, the short-termism of our political system. And yet, despite that, we do seem to still manage to muddle through and come up with a country that people are dying to get to, uh, literally and metaphorically. Um, now, you know, there's, that in itself is controversial, uh, but that speaks to one of the things about Australia that is so darned attractive that is still so resilient, that is still so welcoming, uh, and so, uh, so positive. So I'm very much a glass half full person. Yes, there are big security challenges, and I'm, I'm looking forward to grappling with them in our conversation. Uh, but my sense is that we have uh, lots of good reason to be uh, pretty up upbeat about our future. Huang, your thoughts? Half full, half empty? <laughs> I can offer a perspective maybe from the outside, and um, everywhere I travel, whether it's Southeast Asia or Northeast Asia, I think all the perception about Australia have been positive. That has been quite consistent uh, for a long period of time, and I agree with John. There are reasons to be proud of for Australia: good governance, you know, um, uh, support for the rule-based order, support for international law, and free trade. All of those are really matter. And um, to put it in the perspective on the context right now, I think from the Asian, Southeast Asian particularly um, uh, region, there are a lot of anxieties about China's rise, um, about uh, US um, presence or commitment to the region or not. And in that context, I think Australia really emerges as an oasis of stability. Um, and uh, there is consistent foreign policy, consistent um, image that Australia puts out, and I think uh, in this uh, time of uncertainty, especially for the regional neighbours, smaller and middle-sized <coughs> countries, that stability is really important. So um, th th this is a very uh, positive trajectory that Australia has had. Uh, Professor White, your, your thoughts on that in, in the context of uh, the short-termism in the politics that, we, that John touched on, but are we living off the, the rewards of, of previous generations of our uh, political leadership? Uh, yes, Kieran, look, I, th I think we are. I'm a little bit less optimistic than my fellow panellists. Um, it's not because I don't think Australia's achieved very good things over the last few decades. I think, I think we have. Um, uh, but I think a very significant factor in that has been that we've been living in a very stable region and we've been very closely aligned with the leading power in that very uh, stable region, 
which has made it extremely easy for our region to work well for us. And that's provided the foundation where both politically and economically we've been able to make the Asian story a very successful story for us, and I think overall we, we have. Uh, but that's the, the circumstances which have underpinned that, I think, are changing and changing faster than our political system and our, for that matter, our broader public discourse is acknowledging. Um, and the key shift there, there are several, of course, but the most important one is the rise of China and what that means for America's role in the region. And uh, I don't think our political system at the moment is yet grappling with the significance of what's happening in the shift in, in the distribution of power between America and China and what that means for America's role in Asia and China's role in Asia and so on. I think we're still coasting on in the hope that what's worked for us so well for the last 40 odd years, 45 years, is going to keep working in future and I think that looked implausible 10 years ago and looks frankly ludicrous now. We're in the midst of a huge shift in the way Asia works and we're still pretending to ourselves that it's not happening. You've, um, you've written about it, discussed it for a long time, the idea of uh, the, the China choice. We've heard so often uh, our modern political leaders, uh, Hugh White, say we don't need to choose. We don't need to choose between our economic partnership of China and uh, the strategic partnership of the United States. Why is that not uh, right in, in those simplistic terms? Well, it's, it's right at, at one level, and that is it's right that we don't yet haven't yet had to choose between America and China in a sort of fundamental binary way, the way countries in the Cold War had to choose between the Soviets and the Americans. Um, we, we haven't faced that choice yet. But we might face that choice in future if strategic rivalry between the US and China continues to escalate as it has over the last few years. For the next few years, then they will, both of them will increasingly, even more than they have so far, start to require Australia to make choices. And the other point, of course, is that although we don't have to make that fundamental binary choice, we're making smaller choices all the time. A whole drift of Australian foreign policy today is to try and position ourselves between um, America's desire for us to side with America in resisting China's growing power and China's insistence that we not do that. And I think a great deal of Australian foreign policy is already focused on making that series of choices. The other way of thinking about it is that we do have a choice it's actually the choice that Penny Wong mentioned as being framed in the opening paragraphs, opening passages of the Asian Century White Paper. There's a choice as to whether we as a country try and shape our destiny in a changing Asia or pretend it's not happening. And I thought it was slightly ironic that she cited that because it does seem to me that on both sides of politics, our political leaders are stepping back from, are choosing not to try and really address this challenge as it confronts us, and are choosing instead to pretend that, it, pretend that it's not happening. And I think that is a historic mistake. I think it, it'd be interesting to extrapolate on that in the context of ASEAN, and we'll get to that in, in a moment. But uh, Huang, in terms of the perspective from one of China's neighbours, uh, I'm interested in your thoughts on how Vietnam handles the, the China choice, as, we've, as Hugh describes it. Yeah, well, um, it's been a choice that over thousands of years that have been pondering. Um, and Vietnam um, always prides itself that among um, regional neighbours, it knows China the best because of proximity, because of cultural and political uh, similarities, but also because of trajectory of historical encounters. Yet, um, I think leaders in Hanoi are every day struggling how to respond to China. Um, and uh, I think if to put the con to, into the context of choice and China choice, um, I think Vietnam would choose a peaceful China, would like to choose China, a peaceful and responsibly rising China, and, um, and, and prosperous China, because that would mean that Vietnamese economic model also can succeed and also that political model can succeed as well. But when it comes to um, assertive or even aggressive China, uh, and um, a China that is actually threatening uh, with uh, 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 Vietnam's sovereign claims, that wouldn't be the choice, of course. Um, and uh, I think Vietnam, just like other regional uh, countries, perhaps also including uh, Australia, faces a double challenge. Uh, one is that 
must, uh, it must be very agile and very responsive to, a, uh, to the changing China, very fastly changing China. It's not the peaceful China that is eager to um, participate in, in regional architecture, multilateralism, the peaceful, benign neighbor from the 1990s. Um, it's a very different China today. So uh, that uh, constant um, reimagination of strategies towards China uh, needs to be uh, there. The, the second, the, the simultaneous challenge for Vietnam, I think, and other countries as well, is to have um, in mind that um, everything that Chinese government do is with a longer term view. So they have a long term vision. So having that in mind, both mid term and short term challenges, as long as long term responses, is I think the biggest challenge uh, for a small, of smaller neighbors just like Vietnam. Yeah. And what about uh, Professor Blacksland? You were uh, the, the defense attache in, uh, in your, earlier in your career in Thailand and Myanmar. Mm -hmm. How do those nations handle? The, the rise of, of China and, uh, well, the, that, that uh, parallel superpower of our region, the United States? Yeah, it's a good question. And uh, it's fascinating to see how countries like Myanmar and Thailand are responding. Both Theravada Buddhist countries, the narrow path, uh, very much uh, have uh, parallel experiences and, interestingly enough, politically have come to almost the same point. Uh, you know, um, formerly Burma was a pariah state under the under the the junta, the the slork, that wonderful onomatopoeic word, slork. I love that term. You know, state law and order restoration council. Um, uh, we, you know, it gave a sense of this brutish military regime uh, that was Burma, uh, and they have come down this you know done the, gone down this path of the road to democracy. Um, and the Americans, you know, Obama went a couple of times, loved it, uh, of course, butted up against the economic realities of the fact that Myanmar sits right next door to China, and China has an extraordinary amount of influence over Myanmar. It's got an oil and gas pipeline through to Chakpu from connecting to Yunnan. Uh, it's uh, very, it's got enormous investment there, and sitting between India and China, uh, it's very clear that Myanmar is now seeing that its economic basket is very much tied to China. Uh, and, and Aung San Suu Kyi's presence in, in Beijing repeatedly uh, speaks to that. Interestingly, in, in Thailand, uh, a country which you know, for, uh, still a US treaty ally um, and still has uh, exercised Cobra Gold uh, uh, held uh, at, uh, in, in Thailand with American forces and coalition forces as well, has got uh, increasingly lukewarm, and my colleague, Dr. Greg Raymond, and I have been on a very exciting Minerva Research Initiative project looking at, uh, through the prism of the Thai military, how they view China and the United States, and seeing the waxing and waning of, of, of enthusiasm both for China and the United States in Thailand, a country that is clearly, uh, they've made some concessions, they're now going to buy Chinese submarines, uh, they may, uh, the pr Prime Minister has uh, exercised a, a, a superpower clause in the, in the interim constitution uh, to, uh, the, sorry, the new constitution to uh, uh, overrule objections and approve Chinese investment in a, in a major part of the Belt Road Initiative into Thailand. Um, very interesting to see that, but at the same time we're seeing Prayut very keen, the, Prem uh, the Prime Minister of Thailand, very keen to stay in touch with the United States, not wanting that uh, relationship to wither, and also seeing the significance of ASEAN. The, the, the work we're doing is very interesting to see how the enthusiasm for keeping America engaged in Asia and making sure that ASEAN doesn't unravel is very, very telling. And interestingly also, how they're very interested in what we in Australia say and do. What it appears to me, and this is my hypothesis, is that Australia, uh, we kind of set the regional benchmark. So where Australia goes, others in the neighbourhood are prepared to go just short of, because then you won't quite invoke the ire of China. Uh, and, and I think that's a very interesting perspective about what, what that means for us and how important what we say and do is because it's not just about us. We are studied closely in the neighbourhood. Our actions, our thoughts, our speeches have repercussions in the neighbourhood. And the neighbours all seem to be very interested in, in, in uh, seeing what Australia does and then acting accordingly. Well, yeah, the, the ire of China, Professor White, we've seen what it can mean in terms of the, uh, in the context of the THAAD missile system, the South Korean, uh, the boycotts, economic boycotts of various South Korean goods. Yeah. 
they can put their foot down and, and quite swiftly. If we fast forward, say, a decade, how do you see the Chinese presence in the Asia-Pacific um, under the most powerful leader for decades, likely to extend, many people believe, beyond two terms as president of China? Look, it's a really critical question, um, and you can look at it two ways. What does Xi Jinping want? Mm. I think we know. He wants what he calls a new model of great power relations, uh, and that means that he wants China to be the leading power in Asia. I think if he had his druthers, it would be the only leading power in Asia. I think he'd like to see the United States effectively cease to play a significant strategic role in Asia. Whether he achieves that is going to depend partly on what the United States does and partly what the rest of us does. Uh, it's not at all impossible that the United States, because it remains a very powerful country, could sustain a, a strong leadership position in Asia. I don't think it can sustain the, 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 the dominance that's enjoyed for so long in future, because I think China is too strong to be pushed back into its box. But it could sustain a strong leadership role and help to balance China's power. And, uh, and that's, I think, what the rest of us in the region would very much want. Uh, but that will depend on America being willing and able to use its power effectively. That would be a very tough ask whoever was in the White House. It would have been a very tough ask if Hillary Clinton or Jeb Bush or somebody else had won the election on the 8th of November last year. Under Donald Trump, it's not an outcome you can bet on. And the second possibility is the United States withdraws. Now, most of us, most of the time, find that almost impossible to imagine, inclu including me. Uh, United States power in Asia has been a fact for so long that we can hardly imagine a region without it. But then again, we used to think that about the British and the other Europeans. And Boris Johnson in Sydney a couple of weeks ago, notwithstanding, they're not coming back. And so it's possible that we could live in a region within the time frames that are relevant, perhaps not my, to my career, but relevant to most of yours, that we live in a region in which the United States is no longer playing a significant role. Does China end up then being the dominant power? It depends what Japan does more than anything else. And to a certain extent, what the rest of us, what other countries in the region do, but Japan more than anybody else. And I do think there's a chance that the Japanese will decide to live with China's power, in which case we will all of us live in a region dominated by China. That's not a statement of what I'd like. I find it a bit scary for <laughs> you know, all the reasons Wang mentioned. Very scary. But that is an outcome we clearly have to contemplate. And if Australia doesn't like it, we have to ask ourselves, what are we going to do about it? What, what can we as a country do to avoid China acquiring more power in Asia than we would like them to have? And that's a conversation which we have not even begun to have in Australia. John Blacksland, your, your thoughts on that in terms of how well placed we are uh, as a nation to, to deal with that scenario? And yeah. not just on our own, but as you alluded to, with our, our regional uh, our neighbours and, and others more broadly. Yeah, well, Hugh's right to point out to the problem, but I do think we actually are beginning to have that conversation. I don't think it hasn't started. It has started. I, I certainly, my engagement with uh, government officials in private has been very strongly uh, championing the fact that Australia is seeking, in effect, to do its own pivot back to Asia. Um, there is enormous emphasis being placed on rethinking uh, its engagement with the Philippines, uh, and this isn't just about Marawi, it's about uh, our, our place our, uh, and the significance of the neighbourhood. You know, I'm the director of the Southeast Asia Institute in, in, at ANU. One of the reasons why I took on the job is because I really believe in the importance of ASEAN to Australia. It's the 50th anniversary of the forming of ASEAN today. ASEAN uh, is uh, easy to be dismissed as a weak read, uh, and geostrategists I've spoken to several, you know, are quite dismissive of it. And yet ASEAN has been remarkably uh, successful over its life and remarkably enduring. Uh, and yes, there are aspects of it that don't quite fit the Western mould about how geopolitics should work and how they should balance and you know, exercise great power dynamics. But it, it is a proto-great power. It's a proto-great power. 629 million people, $2.5 trillion economy, the 
gateway, the, you know, what Joko Widodo called the maritime fulcrum. He was talking about Indonesia, but it really speaks to the whole of Southeast Asia. And if you look at that map, and as we do on the STSC logo, and just over your shoulder, uh, Kieran, if you spin that map a bit and you put Southeast Asia directly north of Australia rather than off to the northwest, you get a sense of how significant that space is to Australia and how it's kind of the gate between the Indo and Pacific, and why Rory this morning you know, talks about the Indo-Pacific. I know he's got his detractors on that idea. I think it resonates from an Australian point of view and from a Southeast Asian point of view because it speaks to that space we live in. And when you think about it, the most obvious space where we should be investing is in our relationships with Indonesia and more broadly with Southeast Asia. But that's really hard because they're so different from us. That this is a very diverse group, uh, you know, it demographically, linguistically, historically, culturally, legally, uh, economically, demographically, on so many fronts, it's very diverse and very different from us. But it is important, no one's ever going to tow it away, you know, like, and yet we keep on metaphorically and literally skipping over it. I've heard many uh, strategic thinkers and talkers talk about great power dynamics and forget Southeast Asia. It's Hang on, guys. It's our immediate neighbourhood. And this is, a, as I say, a proto-great power. Now, it's got all sorts of hang-ups. It's got a hang-up with particularly Cambodia. It's got a chip on its shoulder about Vietnam and Thailand. And I think there's something Thailand and Vietnam could work on because C Cambodia is co-opted by China because it doesn't trust its neighbours and because it doesn't feel the United States can be trusted either. So these are things that when, when the neighbourhood looks at us, they see us to a large extent as the, kind of the litmus test for what Southeast Asia should do. How, how hard can we, not just should be, but how hard can we push back to Chinese hard power? Uh, and I think that's something where we actually need to... There's another point here I think worth making. We as a... As a, as a you know, we talk of, as about Australia as a middle power. We're a middle power with small power pretensions. We, we don't like to think of ourselves exercising middle power dynamics. Uh, we are a middle power. We need to think of ourselves as having regional influence. That may be waning economically, you know, in ter relatively speaking, but we have it, we have clout, we have soft power clout as well. And I think we need to reconceive as we think about that strategic balancing act when we manage our relationship with China and we manage a relationship with the United States at deep broad, and we talk about maybe changing that, we need to have a clear sense in our minds of how profound that relationship with the United States is. It is not just d deep, it is very, very broad. We are extremely dependent on that. Now, you can try and unravel that, but you want to be very, very careful about doing it and think through the implications. Because even, even if American power does uh, go down the path that Hugh has projected as possible and it likely, you know, similarly with me, hopefully doesn't happen, but it's quite possible, America still has an interest in Australia and in that maritime fulcrum, that space. That's an enduring American interest, even if it wanes its influence elsewhere in, in the South China Sea. So uh, there's a lot there, but we in Australia, I think, need to reimagine our role, our perspective on the neighbourhood, and how we conceive of what we should do with our neighbours. Huang, you, you up until recently were based at the uh, Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore. What's your view on, on uh, Professor Blackson's thesis there, his, uh, his take on Southeast Asia? Yes, I agree. I mean, today is the ASEAN's 15th uh, anniversary, a big celebration. In fact, I think we should put a little bit of anthem of ASEAN to <laughs> salute to um, this remarkable success. And I, I do think this should be recognised. Um, um, if you, you know, put it in a context of historical difficulties of, of the region, you do uh, recognise the importance of ASEAN. And even today, um, I would like to add on what John said, um, playing a little bit of devil's advocate, if I may, from a perspective of someone who studies ASEAN and who wishes ASEAN well. Um, I mean, uh, I think it's a little bit overwhelming at the moment. Instead of celebrating um, uh, ASEAN successes, uh, there is a little bit too much attention to uh, ASEAN uh, shortcomings, um, which is you know, valid uh, concern and, and should be put out there for constructive uh, reflection and um, ASEAN um, 
probably like any other countries, is a little bit obsessed with great power politics. So it looks very much uh, every day about to China, to the US, um, probably a little bit too much. My own concern is not whether China can tear ASEAN apart uh, or whether you know uh, ASEAN would be confident enough in itself without um, other great powers support, including uh, US uh, and uh, whatnot. But it's, I think a little bit missing um, debate is about how ASEAN sees itself. Mm. Um, and this is quite worrying because, you know, they say there are many leaders in ASEAN, 10 of them at least, right, but little leadership. And, um, and it is true when you don't have leadership, there's, there's lack of unity as well. And there are so many so many dynamics now that speak to different interests, even, you know, internally within one country. One country, if you, you asked me earlier about Vietnam, uh, also has many different views, even though it's one party. Um, and that uh, is similar to any other ASEAN member countries. So if within one country you have so many inconsistent views, uh, you can imagine uh, how many views uh, in ASEAN within, as John pointed out, very, very diverse uh, group uh, there could be. So. Uh, for me, the biggest worry is in how uh, ASEAN can uphold its in internal values. And um, you know, if you want to celebrate another 50 years of anniversary, how can it um, keep commitment to itself among neighbors? Um, and uh, I think you know, there is a big change in the generation of leaders in ASEAN, and whether um, the original um, visions of ASEAN founding fathers who wanted to come together um, and guard against actually um, great power uh, rivalry and other forces in the region. Can this be inherited now and further on? And this is the, the task that ASEAN is really facing, how to uh, you know, make ASEAN people excited about ASEAN themselves, how, how to make them commit to ASEAN. So maybe, you know, a renewal of vows after 50 years? I don't yeah, okay. Well, Hugh White, given the, the potential and, and also the vulnerabilities of, of ASEAN, if you're sitting down with a, a, a new Australian foreign minister, what would your advice be as to how to try and place Australia over the next 10, 20, 50 years? Uh, I'd, uh, I'd put a big emphasis on our relations with Southeast Asia, but I wouldn't frame that through ASEAN. ASEAN as an institution has been extremely successful at a very narrow but very important purpose. What we're actually celebrating the 50th anniversary of today was an agreement brokered by Thailand between the other state, the states of maritime Southeast Asia, which was intended to manage the end of what had been a very contested era between them. ASEAN was, a, was all about managing relations between its member states, and it's been extremely successful at that and has been extremely ex successful in expanding that relationship management process from the original group to include um, the present 10. But it has never functioned effectively as a manager of the relationship between those states and the great powers because its entire history has been framed by an era in which American pr primacy in Asia has been uncontested. And so what we've seen, what we've seen over the last few years, what we saw just uh, last week again in Manila is the difficulty that ASEAN has in trying to manage a position when it's sandwiched between competing great powers like the United States and China. And I think it's very difficult for ASEAN to, as an institution to, to manage that problem because it is precisely because it is so diverse. The geography alone tells us that Vietnam or Laos are never going to have the same attitude towards China as Indonesia, for example, because they're just differently located. Vietnam and Laos have a border with, with China. It makes all the difference in the world, which Australians don't understand because we don't do land borders. But sharing a land... <laughs> thank God. But sharing a land border with a country the size of China changes everything. Um, so I, th I think ASEAN as an institution is not going to do much for us. But I very much agree that one of the things we need to do is to think very carefully about how we develop our relationships with Southeast Asia. I agree with John. After decades and generations in which managing relations with Southeast Asia has been right at the heart of Australian foreign policy, for about the last 20 years, that's fallen away. And I do think that is a historic mistake on our part. 
but I'd caution that the solution to, so to speak, our China problem is not going to be to work to, with the ASEANs to try and push China away because it's just not going to be that easy. They're not going to be that unified and our interests aren't always going to be aligned with theirs. We're not going to, we're not going to subcontract the management of our relationship with China to Hanoi or Vientiane or Bangkok or even Jakarta. We're going to have to think for ourselves about what our interests are in managing that relationship and then see how we can work with the others. So that requires, before we start travelling around the region, let's have a really serious debate at home about how we see our relationship with China and, for that matter, how we see our relationship with the United States, which we hope will remain very important, but which is not going to look like the relationship we've had, I would say, for the last 40 years. Let's uh, head north uh, now and, and look at the Korean Peninsula, yeah. uh, the, the flashpoint in, yeah. in the world right now. Is there any, any path that, forward that you can see? Some talk that Trump should ha open a dialogue with Kim Jong-un, but I can't think of anything much more scary than that. Well, you could sell tickets to it. <laughs> um, and I'd buy one. Um, look, um, I think the reality is uh, that we are going to live with a North Korea that has nuclear weapons and on crescent trends we're going to live with a North Korea that has the capacity to deliver a nuclear weapon on a US city. Not this year, maybe not even next year, but you know, soon. Um, and that does make a huge difference. It doesn't to my mind make much difference to the risk of a nuclear attack on a US city direct because I do have a kind of old-fashioned faith in deterrence, and I think it would, wouldn't be very hard to persuade Kim Jong-un or his successors that a nuclear attack on an American city would result in a very immediate nuclear re retaliatory response from the United States. What it does do is undermine the credibility of US uh, guarantees to its allies in Asia, and that does undermine the strength of America's position in Asia and contribute uh, significantly to the process which is already underway uh, of undermining the US strategic position in our part of the world. And so I think that's a significant factor. The, the, the worry I have is that the more the United States does what it's done for, in the last few months, and for, to a certain extent for the last 20 years, that is repeatedly threaten terrible things to North Korea next, next time they do a nuclear missile test and then do nothing to back them up, and the North keeps on testing and the nuclear capability develops and American political leaders keep on saying it's not going to happen, and it does, that undermines US credibility. And credibility is a very precious commodity in the kind of power political rivalry we're seeing in Asia today. It undermines America's position, not just in relation to North Korea, but also in relation to China. So the trick is, I think, that we're gonna to have to learn to live with a North Korean nuclear capability and think very carefully about how we manage that rather than to undermine our credibility by keeping on pretending we're gonna do something about it, which we're not. Yeah, because as, as you say, it's a deterrent until they use it and become yeah. suicide. In, uh, Hong, what's your view on this? Because in, the view is that China has not uh, helped as much as they could in terms of reining in Pyongyang. But anyone that thought they would, I think, is probably a little deluded because they want that buffer, don't they? They, they want that buffer. They don't want an, an American ally up to their border. That's the bottom line. Well, we tend to think about uh, the crisis or any crisis in general, but this one in particular in terms of, again, great powers, responsibilities, US, China, of course, I, I mean, they are key players. But um, uh, if this is an issue that concerns us uh, as a broader region, and uh, I guess pretty much everyone uh, of us in the room would be concerned about this. Uh, are we okay to leave this responsibility to very unpredictable uh, outcomes? Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a common uh, concern, so, and hence it should be addressed multilaterally. I think every uh, state need, needs to have this responsibility. There's no um, buck passing there, and I think there there is certain consensus on that given the UN res, uh, sanctions. But um, and even ASEAN has come to the consensus upon that. Just uh, 
uh, over the weekend. The leaders have uh, issued uh, the statement saying uh, the region is gravely concerned about the region, so about the, the crisis. So uh, I think it's, it's much more responsibility of Trump or Xi Jinping uh, in dealing with this matter. And John Blackstone, we saw China again uh, uh, join with Russia, the rest of the Security Council, with tougher sanctions on Pyongyang yesterday. That's not the first time, though, is it? Uh, this has happened a number of times over many years, and incrementally, uh, Kim Jong-un and, and North Korea, they edge towards that nuclear capacity. So what, what, mm. what are the options? There are no military options, are there? Uh, well, not realistically. Uh, it's very interesting, the, 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 the agreement. Uh, we'll see how much of that gets actually implemented, because words... Uh, words are words, uh, you know, let's see the deeds, let's see the implementation, uh, because uh, China has enormous influence there. But on your question about the military option, uh, the bottom line is, you know, the planners have looked at the North Korean option uh, for years. It's been a perennial military exercise uh, option for planners in, in US, US Army Pacific and uh, the Korean Forces Command. Um, so what they've, what they've found is that... Um, there's no way of guaranteeing that they've identified all the potential uh, launch points, because many of them are hidden. Um, and so while you could, you know, there's a number of things I could con consider, special forces operations, uh, trying to get Kim Jong-un at wh wherever he's located, maybe conduct several raids to get most of the locations, and then conduct precision guided munition strikes on the identified uh, potential bunkers or the missile launching pads. So what if you miss three? Um, uh, and what about the, the mobile uh, uh, IC, uh, ballistic missile launchers that, have, uh, that are not uh, liquid fuel dependent but solid fuel de uh, rockets that can be moved and launched from different locations that maybe the satellite didn't pick up? Uh, and what about the massed artillery uh, that's hidden and spread out along the, the, the de, uh, just north of the de de demilitarised zone, the DMZ, within range of millions and millions of people in Seoul. How do you, what do you do? Realistically, there's not a viable military option. So the Americans talk it up, they talk it up and they talk about maintaining a military option. Realistically, there isn't one. So the question then is, okay, well, how bad would it be? Well, let's just think about how it's been in the past. We thought it was bad that China, got, that Russia got the bomb uh, back in the late 40s. But then we thought it was terrible that China got it. Then we thought it was terrible that India got it. Then Pakistan got it. And then, you know, Israel and whoever else. Um, and yet none of them have used them. Uh, why? Because as, as soon as you do, there's no way of knowing or having any kind of assurance that you will win. More than likely, you will you in, invoke the opprobrium of the world, and you will lose big time. Most people understand that. And then the question is, okay, is Kim Jong-un a rational actor? Well, my sense is he is a deeply paranoid rational actor. And that paranoid is not unreasonable from where he sits. If you put yourself in a North Korean's shoes, this is a country that was bombed effectively to oblivion during the Korean War. It, it sees America not as the great light on the hill, but as the devil incarnate, okay? So from their perspective, I'm not endorsing that perspective, but when you think about the world from a North Korean perspective, everything that happens is just confirmation of, of, of the need to re-burnish those uh, efforts to make sure you've got the ICBMs, you've got the miniaturised nukes, you've got it all there as soon as possible, lest you fall into the trap that Muammar Gaddafi uh, and Saddam Hussein fell into of relinquishing their weapons of mass destruction. Uh, Hugh White, further on this issue, do you, do you think that um, Trump and others were, uh, were, were deluded, misplaced in expecting Xi Jinping and China to, to really put the foot down on North Korea? And, and further to that, is it overstated, the influence? Because from my understanding, I don't even think Kim Jong-un has ever met Xi Jinping. Yeah, look, I think they were um, mistaken in, in expecting or hoping that China would, so to speak, do their work for them. Um, uh, I do think people exaggerate uh, China's control over uh, North Korea. Um, uh, this is perhaps an impolite analogy, but sometimes talking to American friends, I, uh, 
remind them of Australia's relationship with Papua New Guinea. Um, you look at, Papua, at Australia's relationship with Papua New Guinea, major aid only, you think, well, Australia should have an awful lot of control over what happens in Papua New Guinea. But anyone who knows, knows the Australia PNG relationship knows, no, not at all. And I think that the Chinese, although they have the capacity to turn North Korea off, they can flick a switch. What they don't have is a joystick which allows them to control what North Korea does day by day. It's a very potent, and in its weird way, effective independent regime with a very strong sense of its own interests. And I think if the analysis is right that the Chinese are not prepared to do anything which threatens the survival of the Kim regime. I don't myself think that so much because they fear that if the Kim regime collapses, uh, they'll have American troops on their border on the Yalu River. I don't think the Chinese worry very much about whatever the US Army could do to the PLA on Chinese territory. They're pretty confident, you know, don't fight a land war in Asia is the motto that's, that's chiseled in stone over the um, portals of the Pentagon. Um, I, so, I think, so I don't think that's actually as big a, a problem for the Chinese. I think it's rather that they just think, why deal with that problem? And it would be a problem. There'd be chaos in, in North Korea. There are nuclear weapons on the loose. They'd rather not deal with that problem. And they'd rather just kick it down the road. But the other point is that I do think Chinese strategists are likely to calculate that they benefit from the present situation. They don't like the idea of North Korea having a nuclear weapon. But they do like the fact that North Korea having a nuclear weapon complicates America's relationship with its allies in the Western Pacific. And the Chinese are hard men. They're playing a tough game. This is real power politics for something which is very important to them. They are very willing to take risks, including strategic risks, to help, un to help them undermine US standing in Asia and North Korea's doing their work for them. So the idea that the Chinese would help America solve that problem, it wasn't going to happen. Um, and uh, Hong, if we look at another flashpoint in, in the region, the reclamation of the, the, the reefs and the islands of the South China Sea, what's the view from Vietnam and from other affected nations? Well, um, I think the South China Sea has been a, quite a central point at the uh, ASEAN ministers, uh, foreign ministers meeting uh, just over the weekend. Um, and uh, Vietnamese position on that has been consistent um, in pursuing peaceful resolution of uh, dispute uh, in uh, relying to the rule of law and um, international law, law. And it has been uh, emphasizing these. Um, at uh, the recent meeting, Vietnam has been pushing to put an, um, in the ASEAN uh, collective uh, joint uh, uh, statement that um, is a, a, a common concern for the region and it pushes for demilitarization, which also uh, have met with certain pushback from uh, neighbor countries, including the claimants, uh, allegedly including the Philippines, who was, uh, who were the, uh, who was chairing uh, the, the meeting. So uh, I think uh, the militarization and uh, island building in South China Sea concerns everyone um, in the region, whether they have direct claims or not. Uh, however, um, how do they respond to it diplomatically and open or, or backstage? It's been uh, very different um, uh, over the past few years. We've seen uh, in ASEAN uh, the change of government in the Philippines change a little bit of balance uh, within the uh, Southeast Asian claim, uh, claimant group. Um, because Philippines was the one who really took uh, the legal actions um, against China. Uh, and uh, however, Duterte's uh, coming to, to power uh, have um, kind of um, um, deep downplay, downplayed uh, uh, the dispute um, for the benefit of a better relations, bilateral relations with China, which is uh, concerning for everyone in the region, not only because, um, you know, because they care of, about their neighbors' uh, national interest and dispute, but it questions the, the value of international law. It questions the value of the system that is supposed to be based on the rule of the law. And if this is neglected, and um, uh, despite the arbitral tribunal ruling, then what can we expect next? I mean, for best, uh, worst scenarios in Hanoi's uh, government is already, okay, if um, seas can, uh, can be manipulated like that, what's next, maybe air spaces? Uh, so, you know, it's all about uh, um, 
um, how we can uphold and guard the international law. John Blacksland, do you think Australia has a role to play in guarding that international law in the sense of taking part in the freedom of navigation operations within 12 nautical miles uh, of the reclaimed Chinese territory, as the Americans up until recently hadn't done under Trump, but they've now done, as I understand it, two uh, freedom of navigation exercises. Should Australia follow suit? Hmm. Yeah, my sense is that um, Australia should be very cautious. Australia is already conducting, we heard this morning, op Operation Gateway, um, which is a <clears throat> maritime air patrols over the South China Sea. Uh, it conducts uh, transits through the South China Sea routinely with the uh, Royal Australian Naval Vessels. Uh, but there is a reluctant reluctance to go where the United States under Admiral Harry Harris has encouraged us to go, I think for very good reason. Uh, the United States has been effectively behaving like a fickle player lately, and it's not at all clear that the United States has our interests all that much at heart. Now, I'm not down, you know, I'm not dissing the Americans here. My, that's not my point. My point is that we're not that important to them. What is important is the relationship with China and then Japan and then dealing with North Korea. And if a deal needs to be struck that requires some kind of compromise, perhaps over the South China Sea, and if Australia was to be too front-footed on a FONOP, like going within a 12 nautical mile of one of the islands that is claimed by China, occupied by China, and recognised by the arbitral tribunal ruling as meriting a 12 nautical mile territorial sea, and there are a handful that do and a handful that don't, if you do that, you are, you are unnecessarily, I think, putting yourself in a space that is not in Australia's interests. Um, and uh, so I think we need to be very wary about doing that. I think we should continue doing what we do. Uh, but there's another point here I think is worth noting, and that is that uh, we don't want to then just completely vacate the field. China will, I believe, and this is up, you know, up from a huge amount of debate, will take as much as you let it as we give. Um, and I think there is a parallel there with the expansion of the British Empire 200 years ago. Uh, Britain expanded incrementally. There wasn't a great plan to, to conquer the world. Uh, the British East India Company established itself. The military followed. There are, there are, com there's a parallel there with China's expanding economic interests and therefore looking to secure those economic interests. That's actually not unreasonable. It's quite reasonable. Uh, but then how much they, how, how they exercise that reasonable right uh, is one that requires a bit of checking, and I think Australia needs to be forthright about defending its interests and about co cooperating with neighbours in defence legitimate interests of our neighbours that are actually congruent with our interests and in messaging back to Beijing that we respect their role, we respect their historical uh, entitlements, but we also respect those of our neighbours, and we expect China to respect that too. And I, I think that's quite reasonable. Professor White, what are your overarching views of China and that region in the context of the so-called nine-dash line, the view that um, China is going to be imperialistic in its uh, growth. Do you, are you uh, pessimistic or are you, you know, sanguine about the, the rise of China in the sense that they, are, they see themselves as the middle kingdom and they won't overreach? Oh, I'm pessimistic. Um, look, I think the the key thing to understand about the South China Sea is that we're looking really at an issue which is running at two levels. At one level there is a significant issue about ownership of contested reefs and rocks, about conflicting claims to maritime areas like the Nine Dash Line, uh, uh, questions about how these issues are resolved, whether multilaterally or bilaterally, all the stuff one hears talked about all the time. But underpinning that, and the reason why we're talking about it, is that that whole set of issues is just a proxy for the strategic rivalry between the US and China, which both Washington and Beijing, for different reasons, believe it to be to their advantage to play out in the South China Sea. And it is, I think, a dangerous situation because it is a, a, a point of contention where inherently insignificant issues are directly linked with huge questions about regional order and great power uh, politics. And just as, if I can use this analogy, in 1914 Europe went to war over a relatively insignificant question about the status of Serbs in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, 
it would be perfectly possible for the US and China to go to war over a relatively insignificant issue like who owns Mischief Reef or whether there should be a base built on Scarborough Shoals. Uh, China is using that uh, confrontation as a way of showing that America is no longer as strong in the region as it used to be. America is trying to use that confrontation as a way to demonstrate to the region that China is threatening to their interests and that they should support the United States. Both believe they can win on that space. I suspect China at the moment is doing better than America, um, but there's a very significant risk, I think, that that will be the point at which the US-China competition turns into a confrontation. And I think the management of that is therefore much more important than the question of who ends up owning Mischief Reef or who ends up building a base on Scarborough Shoals. And it's really not appropriate to be handling such a, a nuanced and uh, precarious situation via Twitter, is it, as the president does? Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a worry. Any final thoughts from you, John Blackson, before we wrap up? And, yeah. And, uh, Juan? Thanks, uh, uh, Karen. Uh, my sense is, you know, we talk about regional arrangements. I think there is one that we haven't uh, quite come up with yet, and that's one I call manis, which is a word in Bahasa Indonesia means sweet which is, stands for Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia and Singapore. We are recognising the limitations of ASEAN, while very supportive of ASEAN, I think there is space for Australia to reimagine its relations with its immediate neighbours, uh, and that's something that I think really needs to be thought through. Indonesia, the Indonesians I've spoken to have been quite enthusiastic about it. There seems to be a little bit of traction to that idea of sweetening regional ties for Maritime Regional Corporation Forum. Wong, any final thoughts? Um, yeah, I think... Um as we celebrate, again, 50th anniversary of ASEAN, a lot of thinkers in the region um, warn each other that we can't take peace for granted because it was hard-earned for, for Southeast Asian region in particular. But I think this is a moment more than ever we can't take a peace for granted. And, and um, each country, whether small or middle or great, uh, have equal responsibilities in safeguarding the peace. So mm. that's my Thanks for uh, listening, Dr. John Blackson, Dr. Uh, Professor John, uh, John Blackson, Dr. Hong Lee Tu, and Professor Hugh White. Thank you for your participation. Thank you.